I've got a number of questions and thoughts which I'm going to open up the conversation with. Um, but if you want to add something, then when I say, just wave a hand in the air and we'll get a bit of that as well. So if we can come back together, that's great. Uh, just an interesting one that I think is emerging. Um, um, Chun Yin has said, uh, do we really want smart cupboards, smart beds? How do we start a meaningful conversation about what we as a society want from robotics? Uh, and if that isn't happening, do we need one? So just because we could is not necessarily because we want to. Who would like to respond to that challenge? Stefan. I mean, maybe, maybe I can start. And I think, I mean, I'm very much wanted to kind of spark these thoughts because even though I'm coming from the technical side, I think all of us as a society, we have, we have to start this dialogue. Now, how it starts, I don't know either. Um, I, I would guess to some degree market forces will, will somewhat tell what, what products might work and what won't. Um, but, but I'm not too much an expert and I, I, definitely, I definitely hope um, we can have a, a right. dialogue beyond that. I mean, I would have thought that the kind of home automation is, 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 is less controversial, is um, on the kind of useful end of the spectrum, whereas other maybe of the more futuristic ones mm. Um, are more controversial when it comes to, yeah, for instance... I suppose uh, so, though. So that actually going to the fridge and taking the beer out is part of my life. sensory life experience. <laughs> yeah, I agree with that. Oh, someone just passed, by the way. Um, when are we going to have a robot that can pick up their children's toys at the end of the day? Whether we are going to have that? Yeah. <laughs> Give me a date. <laughs> Before 2037, it's getting desperate in the it's, household. I, 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 yeah, I think you might have to wait 10 years or more for, for that to happen. Okay. And, and hopefully the robot can then also teach your kids how to not let things on right. the floor. And, and if they and don't... won't just clear can, up the mess. Can it, can, it, can it do that? I'm not going to comment Okay, no, 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 no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> just, just whether you've got a response to this question, it's just because we can. Uh, where's, the, where's the discussion going about what what usefully enhances our, our quality of life as opposed to just because we can. Yeah, I think I want to actually follow up on what uh, um, Stefan was saying. It's really important in a situation where we need to have uh, this uh, personal assistant in the home, so for old people, for instance, right? So having automation in the home that can help old people doing, you know, supporting the daily activity is really going to be more and more essential. So we are a society where actually ages uh, you know, so the population is increasing in age and the problem exists and they will develop more and more. So having the ability of such intelligent support in domestic environment or sort of healthcare environment and so on are really truly essential. So what is a general commodity that everybody will need it to have because they have to say they have it? That is just that the market is going to dictate the kind of changes. Okay. Uh, for those of us who are not steeped in this world, we are... Uh, there's always this question about the sort of uh, uh, robots taking over in future and the kind of Terminator scenario. And I can see it. I mean, this thing is, this, this thing is, these things are sussing me out. Uh, and, it, and it wouldn't take much of a flip for them to be in control. Did you, how, okay, is that discussion taking place? Or, or is that just, am I eating, reading too much 2037 science fiction? Yeah, I think uh, actually I really want to advocate that really all this technological advancement has to be driven to improve people's life and not taking people's life, uh, you know, not taking life away from people. So really, for instance, in my examples before, all the decision support and, you know, realized by intelligent machines are not because they replace the human activity, but it's because they help human in seeing things that maybe they can't, you know, they can't do because yeah. there is a much quantity of data to deal with, and so this large quantity of knowledge to process. So this is, can only just improve. We shouldn't be right. worried that it's replacing us, you know, or it's taking over. But that's a life. lovely world full of people who have positive intent. Uh, there have been other uh, inventions uh, through science that have actually uh, taken us in different directions. Uh, Stefan, yeah, I just maybe, want, and also Marco, maybe yeah. a comment on that. Maybe you may just want to just move your microphone so it's supporting, that's it, that'll, that'll help. Yeah, uh, okay. Stefan first, then um, Marco. 
Yeah, so maybe um, just to add a little bit um, on, on that thought, I think still technologically we are really quite far away from this truly human level of intelligence as well as embodiment of intelligence in, you know, in, in an actual machine um, that is as, as versatile as, as a human. So in that sense, I'm not, I'm not as uh, afraid as other people are. I think you know, today's robots are still quite stupid in the end. Um, that having said, this right. is my opinion and some <laughs> respectable roboticists see it differently. So it's definitely a, a dialogue that, that we are having. And in, in fact, you can today build machines that are really scary when it comes to, to military applications. Um, you know, th these machines don't, they don't have to uh, make sensible predictions about us and how to interact. They, they just have to kill. Um, and you can build really scary machines where I think uh, we have to have a very serious discussion to the point of, you know, uh, limiting, setting the boundaries via uh, Geneva Convention right. kind, of, uh, kind of thing. So I, again, I think it really depends on what part of robotics are we talking about and what kind of threats that there are. I think there are some that are quite real. Um, others, when it comes to, you know, just entering our everyday lives and completely taking over, I'm less worried about that part. Um, doesn't mean we shouldn't okay. have the conversation. Marco, do you want to yeah, add a thought here? I'm um, just going back you know, to your original question. And um, in the Dessel School, you know, we have in our know, research in robotics, and you know, uh, based on kind of in our content discussion we have had, you know, we've seen an interest uh, from um, companies that provide services in large cities to try to kind of uh, automate some of the operation. Um, so, for example, last mile delivery uh, that they're thinking about. Um, um, trying to kind of you know, use robots for that. So I would say that there is an interest out there. Um, I don't know whether it's backed up by kind of uh, any kind of uh, market evidence, but you know, th there are companies that are making steps in that direction. Right, okay, interesting. Uh, another question coming in, kind of where's the pace being set? Is it being set in, in tech firms that are doing stuff or is it in academic institutions? You're bound to say it's academic institutions with Imperial at the head of it. But uh, be objective for a moment. Where are you sensing that the, you, know, you read the mags and all the rest of it? Where's the, where's the real thrust and drive taking place? Who wants to offer me? And Alessandra. Well, there is clearly a lot of uh, activity in the industrial sector. So the, and and it's sort of with the objective of really developing a new uh, sort of you know, systems of applications uh, or you know, which is really for the own personal business uh, uh, purposes. But I do think, and at the same time, there's also a lot of activity happening in universities. So we are really quite at the edge of that. And really the success, in my view, has to be really in the collaborations between the two because so we can go very much ahead in our theory, in our research. But actually, we would like to demonstrate that in the real world problems, and companies want to have the real world problem in their hands. And vice versa, you know, a company might not have enough, uh, let's say, uh, sort of research development uh, organization to be able to know what is outside in academia. Right. So I think the thrive is to come from both directions. Okay. Uh, just whilst you're on, uh, um, Alessandra, um, the, the top scorer in our, in our answer the question, oh, apart from the one which says, will the slides be circulated? <laughs> I, think it's the, I think it's the only question to which we can give a definitive answer this afternoon. And the answer is yes, uh, you will be emailed with a thank you following the conference, which will have a link uh, to the slides. So you can, you can look at strange ro robots doing weird things to your heart's content. But uh, going back to your presentation, uh, you had the Helen example in the scenarios. Um, and there's a question saying, what was Helen actually adding? It seemed that Mimi made her redundant. Can you just rehearse that? Maybe this is a reinforcement of the thing. It's just because we no, can. I What's think, the point? Uh, I think it, it, I mean, I, it wasn't at all. It wasn't at all intention to show that Mimi, uh, that the Helen is redundant. Actually, it's the intention to show that Mimi is not really able to understand what is the best thing to do for Helen unless Helen can communicate that to the system, to the applications. So maybe this, the, the examples about the software engineering, the software debugging, uh, and things like that there could be something that can be automated. But ultimately, there has to be a general opinion and decisions by the human being. So all these three scenarios really rely very much on the success if the human being is at the center of it. 
So in the first case, a wine actually is able to provide suggestion for the Helen and not for any person. And when the second case, when he's able to certify, you know, support Helen in, in deciding whether it is the right correction to make in the software. So they can provide the support in the decision making. And in the third examples, they can also give guidelines and excellent information that Helen is not allowed to, they're not aware of, but Helen ultimately decides what to do. Right, okay. Uh, just another one, uh, you know, a lot of the examples and maybe the work you're doing, you know, I can see uh, that we are going to get rid of every, um, every uh, hotel person who makes beds, cleans the rooms, all the rest of it, zzz, all wonderful first world problems and, and, and issues and get my beer and all the rest of it. Uh, we are on the brink of a global crisis, 10 billion people, we have a crisis of climate change, water, goodness knows, feeding the population, all sorts of issues. Um, this feels as though this could just make uh, those of us, um, uh, you know, who have the wealth, uh, uh, have some more gizmos, lifestyle, style and, and life becomes even more fun with fewer people employed. Can you give us a sense as to whether there is research discussion about how this really maybe bites in with some of the compelling crisis issues that are facing society, particularly in less developed countries? Can anyone offer me some encouragement that this isn't just a new toy because we can? Um, I think, uh, first of all, I want to agree with, with that concern, um, absolutely. And it's possibly a discussion that we as roboticists um, being part of, you know, uh, but it might not be part of our job as much, so we maybe don't have it enough. Um, that having said, I, I still think, though, that robotics also has uh, a lot of potential. Gen generally, technology has a lot of potential to also address some of those issues quite directly with things like um, automation in agri agriculture when you're talking about feeding the world population. So this is a, a real challenge that we have right now um, that we, we, we could definitely benefit from uh, from robotic tools, from, from, from learning, understanding. Um, now it becomes a problem of really distributing it um, all around the world. And I guess that's not only a problem for, for such technologies, it's generally a problem of distribution of wealth. Um, now again, that's, that's a broader political discussion. I'm not sure um, I'm, I'm the expert of, of having it, but I definitely encourage everyone to, to have it because right. the problem uh, of the crisis is real. I agree with that. Right. Does anyone want to add? Uh, well, I just that? wanted to follow up in the example of the agriculture and then, the, you know, developing world. So one of the um, collaboration discussions I have, for instance, at Imperial is with also companies. Uh, can we develop uh, this uh, cognitive system that they can actually learn, help learning a uh, work out, uh, for instance, a new way of doing, uh, um, making plants more resistant to certain type of climate changes? And of course, in order to get to that point, uh, you need to have uh, this complexity in the system. They are able to understand uh, what is the current knowledge about the genetic implants and uh, be able to monitor at the same time. So robotics uh, or, you know, sort of flying robots to be able to understand and take images and uh, process these images and um, help uh, work out the impact a certain type of uh, treatment on plants that could help or not help in different climate conditions. So there is a lot into it that we can do if we actually are able to integrate all these different technology for the purpose, you know, for the goods of, uh, right. you know, human being. So okay, all right. Uh, opening up, I, I have this technology, I've got lots more questions, but um, this is a multi-channel conversation. If you feel you've got a question and you want to shout it out and you've got the voice to do it, just put a hand in the air and I will come to you. Fortunately, a microphone won't come to you, but if you think, ah, I want to say something, just stick a hand in the air. Otherwise, I shall continue with, uh, with some fascinating questions um, that, are, um, that are emerging here. How can symbolic learning cope with fake news? understand what does it mean, fake news? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right, yes. That's what we start with. Whoa, the there we are. That's a, who, who asked that question? So, <laughs> I don't know where no, you are. Anonymous. Actually, Love it. Uh, so interesting. We can actually, we can actually, this is interesting because I was in a talk in Germany. There is a big uh, uh, lab in the US called the Red Hand where they're actually collecting tons of video clips about the BBC, the US news, the CNN news and so on. And there is a lot to study of what does it mean a multimedia 
in a frame. And uh, so, and if you're able to understand this, there's tons of data, but nobody really can label this data, right? So if you're able to understand uh, what does it mean in multimedia frame, how people communicate the news and so on, in a very more general abstract manner, we should be able also to use that to label this data, work out what is fake or not fake. Right, <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm just interested also, I mean, this, this, this gathering is saying, hey, 2037, so we're, we're giving ourselves a bit of breathing, uh, yeah. breathing space. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, two things. One, where can I go and, uh, you know, maybe all three of you, this stuff is actually happening, I'm seeing it, it is changing, Hmm. stuff so first of all uh, a living real example of what's going on that you think ah that shows that it's useful stuff and also are we talking 2037 or is suddenly over the next five years just this quantum change towards the sort of things you're doing going to take place so maybe first of all can you point to something you know as I look out of the window across London um, that is that's beginning to really show a difference and, and, and create value? And secondly, are we 2037, or are we maybe sooner for that, for this, this tsunami of change to take place? Marco, start at the end there. Um, right, I'm gonna take these questions, you know, with the idea of um, a future in which robotics, you know, will start to deploy uh, within uh, our society in a large city and um, also trying to bring in my interest in designing experience and human factors, you know. So I can see lots of challenges there. Um, it's, it's not, you know, obvious how they will be uh, tackled, you know. Um, some are kind of legal, I think, you know, Stefan mentioned them earlier. Um, some are kind of, you know, really related to understanding, you know, what actual kind of, you know, benefits they bring to, to the people. Um, so I see, uh, quite, you know, some elements of complexity that are really related to understanding, you know, these interfaces and how right. we can make them work effectively. Um, th there's still kind of, you know, some way ahead of us. Okay. Sh Stefan. And, okay, so talking about real-world examples, um, I think there are a lot relating to, to what I was talking about. Um, uh, for instance, autonomous driving, right, is, um, is, is something maybe, maybe not happening right now, as in you're actually allowed to let your car drive your, yourself around. But the technology is really getting there, and we see things like autopilots um, that you know, may or may not be a good idea to use, but you can. You can uh, use some of that. That's the technology that is getting us there. Um, there's drones, consumer-level drones um, that start to actually have these algorithms, these exact algorithms I was, I was talking about, um, uh, embodied in their brains um, such that they can fly around, um, solve different, different tasks. It can be something like an uh, industrial inspection that you would see um, such, such devices used for, or, or, or just maybe even to take a selfie or to follow you around and shoot the video. I mean, these are actual products right. that, that are really getting there, and we will see more of, of those, and we'll see them to be more intelligent. Now, how fast it will happen is really difficult uh, to say. Mm. Um, I, it was quite, uh, quite interesting, I was, I was facilitating a, uh, a conference, a, a German-American conference between uh, Joey at uh, Harvard, and they had the chief exec of General Motors, um, and they were, you know, they were predicting that by 2025, 50% of vehicles will be autonomous. We had the um, minister in charge of transportation regulation, and they are putting in place regulations for cities so we know who's responsible if there's a prang. So they're, so they're putting in place that stuff, and it seems almost unbelievable to many of us, but, but the industry appears to be going at an extraordinary rate on this. Alessandra, I just want a, a response to my question. Uh, yeah, well. I think uh, there are clearly examples uh, nowadays, on, for instance, in London, I'm sure there's a lot of advancement in, in medicine. So all the different technology and image processing and uh, with, with different type of machine learning algorithms, which are really helping there nowadays already. Uh, and going back to some of the examples I was showing, uh, so we are also starting to make a quite a good progress in uh, combining this deep learning with symbolic machine learning. So we're able now to understand a little bit better natural language processing. So the little scenario I showed before about uh, the social network uh, is actually something that is happening in my lab. So we're actually able to process and uh, classify 
people who can be actually breaking the privacy or not, uh, and the confidentiality of the information. So this stuff uh, will need to be in place uh, to help people in the daily activity. And they are actually happening. But as you're saying, uh, how fast we can go to, to reach really the vision of 2037 that we are depicting, that is just uh, and still an open question. Today. Right, okay. Yeah, just take a, a live question. You are, and you'll need to you, pretend you are on the platform at Stratford. <laughs> You may want to stand, if, or is that an imposition? Okay. So, no, I'd just like to ask the panel a little question about continuous learning, and because that was going to be part of the, uh, yeah. the presentations. And I, I know we have it in respect to some consumer preferences, but in taking that somewhat further to more significant, should we say, how, what, what progress is being made in developing a viable continuous Right. Yeah. And so, Sandra? So I think uh, uh, we are making, so we, the, the kind of uh, progress has been made from the theoretical and algorithmic point of view. So the kind of symbolic and machine learning I was describing above uh, before in my presentation, they actually have this capability. We have uh, demonstrated uh, in a various application in software engineering, for instance, oh, for software engineering, that we are actually able to evolve uh, continuously the requirement of software systems. Uh, based on new evidence and, concept and changes uh, in the environment. So we've done, for instance, application adaptive systems. So like robots that move around an environment and they have to continuously update the model they have about the environment as they explore it in order to be able to understand what is the best actions in that case, right? So, so the learning there can be on two aspects. So it's a learning from the structural, conceptual point of view so realize that there is something else, a new concept that, that the machine is not aware about, as well as a learning in adapting uh, within the, the boundary of the models that already, the machine already has, right? So in the advancement in this continuous learning is be able to do both, is to be able to do conceptual, structural, not new knowledge based on new evidence, as well as uh, you know, adaptation within uh, this new knowledge. So this is, I'm talking about a more quantitative adaptation. So understanding what is most likely or less likely and adjust <coughs> some parameter in the models. Makes sense? Uh, well, I'm not sure how I, I don't really understand conceptual learning in relation to, say, software development. Mm. So uh, the software, for instance, adaptive systems, uh, in order to be able to work in an environment, they have to have a model of the environment. All right. So this model can be hard coded. So in adaptive software engineering, there's a lot of work on how the machine is able to continuously adapt what they think the environment is as it is it. So and the advancement that we have made is how we can learn structure, you know, new models that are represented as a, as a structural model, not just a quantitative, uh, uh, probabilistic right. models. This feels like a conversation to further develop over a cup of tea. Perfect. Uh, now, we're just talking of tea, we're just about that. Oh, is that a quick one? I'm not sure it's quick. Go on then. <laughs> you are? Xavier, District 3, Mission Center in Montreal. I was in Geneva last week and I was very surprised to find out that the European Parliament is, is conceding the electronic person tax. So that this whole liabilities of weapons and, and things is given to this new person, which is not a corporate person, not a human person, but this electronic person. I was wondering if you guys were, since you're in the field, are you involved with these Anyone want to offer a response? Stefan? Uh, I must admit I'm not, um, but um, it would be good to have people from our side involved in, in, in these kind of conversations. Hmm. Anyone else? Well, I actually I want to add to that. I also read an article saying that at the European community level, they are pushing for legislations in which any decision that the machine is making has to be explained. Because of this big problem about who to make liable if something goes wrong, it actually will exist more and more. It will become bigger and bigger. So for instance, in my symbolic machine learning approaches, we are able to explain what the machine has learned and why it has got to that learning knowledge. Right. And I think this is vital. So even if there is an electronic person doing legislation and coming up with new legislation, this can be done in collaboration with experts and provided that they are open box, they are clear what they're learning. That's exactly what you're recommending. Exactly, the exactly. Industry doesn't seem to like that much. I know. <laughs> Big surprise, uh, but yeah. thank you very much indeed for that. We're right up against the cup of tea. I just wonder if I got off one final message 
from each of you. In this audience are some of the great companies thrusting, driving forward in the UK and internationally um, as Imperial business partners and others trying to make sense of this world we're moving into. We're stretching to 2037. If there was a today message, watch this space or some unusual thing we didn't expect you to say that might condition some of our thinking about this brave new world into which we're moving, what would that, that little message be? And if it can be no more than two sentences, you will be my friend for life. Marco. Right. Um, so we live in a world in which um, we have um, increasingly complex in our product systems, uh, services, and uh, we are good at you know, developing the technology that's behind that, but we need to think more about you know, how we create you know, the experiences that are around you know, these systems. And um, we need also to think about you know, why people want them, why do they want to own and, and how they own them. Okay. And by answering that, you know, we can develop, you know, better interfaces. Okay, Stefan, I'm still trying to get my own beer from the fridge. <laughs> Convince these people that uh, we should be listening to what you're talking about. Well, I think it's uh, think outside the box. In a lot of applications, we try to replace the human with a human-like robot, but that might not be the best solution to, right. to accomplish the task. Okay, and finally, finally, Alessandra. So what I would say is um, my message is don't trust the machine that takes the decision for you unless they're able to explain why they got to the, how they got to the decision. Right. So really my warning message is really we need to be much better in doing that automatically. Buyer beware some be time aware. to come. Yeah, okay. Just be aware. Okay, yeah. panelists, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, our three speakers <laughs> so far. Thank you very much. Just stay for a moment.